turf for getting back to clay um, popped up. I started taking classes, much like you offer here at Sawmill. Kind of tried a few different places. Um, had some really great experiences, but I was really looking for more. I wanted clay at that point in my life to be more than a hobby or even an advocation. I really wanted to make a life for myself centered around clay and, and making pots. However, in a class, some, again, like you offer here at Sawmill, someone told me about a program at the Worcester Center for Crafts. And I, I hope some of you here and online both are familiar with the Worcester Center for Crafts. It's a wonderful organization. I know there's a great relationship between Sawmill and Worcester Center for Crafts because the director there, a gentleman by the name of Tom O'Malley, is a great guy and a great potter and a great, great, great teacher. Uh, introduced Dot and I uh, last fall. And uh, so the Worcester Center for Crafts at that point in time was offering a program they called uh, Professional Craft Studies. It was a two year program um, centered around, in my, place, in my case, obviously ceramics, but they offered glass blowing, woodworking, a few other things. So I quit work. Um, which I was fortunate enough to be able to do for about a year and a half. And I went back to school at 47 years old. Um, had some early successes. Um, and while I was there, burned my first pot with clay. It's a nice, beautiful little kiln up at the Worcester Center for Crafts um, and was able to burn. And the minute I burned clay, first time there. And the minute I did that, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I really didn't have to go exploring too much further than that. Um, I recognized at that point in time that I wanted to be a wood fired potter. And there's a lot to being a wood fired potter, which hopefully we'll get into a little bit uh, from that. I spent about a year and a half to two years up at Worcester. Um, again, it's a wonderful organization. I, I have a tremendous sense of uh, gratitude and indebtedness WCC and the people there. Started at that point in time, um, starting to sell my work. And I often say, and I say it with a, a measure of humor, that I sell pots to give me an excuse to make more pots, but there's probably some truth to that. Around 2008, we actually built in our home, outside our home, our first wood kiln from probably 2003 to 2007 or so. I was throwing pots in the corner of our basement, like many people do. Spending time up at Worcester Center for Crafts, learning as much as I could. Was able to take some workshops, different places, things like that. But we finally built a wood kiln. Had some success with some juried shows. There's actually a piece in the gallery here this evening, which was in a juried uh, show out in Chicago. Obviously didn't sell because it's here tonight <laughs> in the gallery. Um, but at least it was accepted, you know, which was always good for my ego, but also wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, I love making pots. I enjoy selling pots in our local community. And over these last 15 years, I've really developed a, a great clientele and a great relationship with people who come in and out of our gallery. This is uh, our location. So the larger building in the forefront is my studio where I, I throw. Uh, I do have a bisque kiln there for bisque firing. And the smaller building in the background, uh, half of that is a gallery that we have in the back half is a glazed studio. Um, so I'm able to separate all my glaze material and mixing and things like that from, from our clay throwing. We opened uh, what we call Midge's Gallery. If you're interested and we have a little time, ask me who Midge was. I'll be glad to tell you about Midge. And um, we opened that just at the end of last year or the beginning of this year a little bit. Um, and of course, the pandemic hit. But actually, it's been pretty happy with the results of having that gallery. We used to clear out the front two rooms of our home every Thanksgiving and opened up our house as a gallery for almost 10 years for people to come through from 
the Friday after Thanksgiving to New Year's Day. And then we would pack it all up and bring all the furniture back. And it was great, but having a separate gallery space is wonderful. And my wife, I know, would agree, who's, who's online this evening too. Um, we leave the gallery open pretty much all the time. As I mentioned, I have a, a, a real nice relationship with people in the community. People will order online from our website or they'll just send me a text, ask if they can come. I say, absolutely, go ahead in there, order it, take it, send me a check, do whatever you want to do. And uh, it's really worked out well for us. A lot of artists talk about process. So I'm going to start talking about my work talking about process, there are two tools of mine that are core to who I am as a potter. One is our kiln, which is a 70 cubic foot um, wood fired um, single chamber catenary arch Norabagama kiln. We'll talk about all of those things a little bit as we go. And then the second um, major influence tool wise or process wise is I throw on what's called a leech treadle wheel. Um, oh, you all right? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Okay. That's down here trying to communicate with the, with the computer. Okay, so a leech treadle wheel is a little bit different than a kick wheel. I don't know if people are familiar with what a leech treadle wheel is. The flywheel on the bottom of that is obviously operated by foot on, a, on an oscillator blading treadle as opposed to picking the wheel. And that flywheel at the bottom of that uh, device is light. It is not heavy. In fact, the one in the foreground is a homemade wheel I found in Virginia. Um, I paid about $400 for it. And the one in the background is recently made by a wonderful craftsman down near Penland, North Carolina. We charged about eight times that. <laughs> and I almost, if you tell, told me I had to make a choice, I'm not sure which one I would choose. Um, but the flywheel is very light. What that means is you don't get momentum and then momentum then carries the wheel. You have to, you have to work that wheel, which means you don't get a mechanical consistent revolution and you don't get a consistent force of your hands on the material. What that does for me is um, I try to believe, and hopefully you can see that in the work, is it develops what I like to think is a more relaxed and organic feel to the pots. And that, that's really, and plus, you know, my personality type, it forces me to slow down, it forces me to think, um, and that's, that's good for me. We'll talk quite a bit about the kiln and um, the journey to building that kiln as we, we get into more a little bit about wood firing. I do want to talk a little bit. If I can move. Hi, David. Did we do anything with the... Uh... disconnected my oh there we go okay so there's the kiln the detail of the kiln and there is a uh, picture of, of the site uh, both with wood and without wood so a couple things about this um, one of the reasons I'm here is to invite any of you who would be interested in working with dot there's obviously a limited number of slots we're going to do a firing with the with the sawmill pottery community in April in our in our kiln. Um, you can see it's a pretty nice location, I think, but there's also lots of room for camping. So if you want to bring a tent, um, this is a 30 hour process. Um, so if you want to bring a tent and you want to burn some of your pots with wood, you're welcome. And you should see Dot and her team. To uh, sign up for that. The wood that you see stacked there on both sides of the kiln, it's about three and a half cords, and that's about what it takes to fire that kiln to a cone 10 firing for 2385 degrees. So 
it's a lot of wood and that takes a pretty good um, community to fire it successfully. You don't fire a wood kiln of this size by yourself. So there's a couple other potters locally that fire with me. Um, and I have a lot of friends and family in town that uh, run some of our shifts as we fire. So that's the kiln site. A little bit about the influence of my work. Um, I think aspiring writers are often told, write what you know. And I think in some respects, making pots is a little bit the same. So I feel I'm influenced a lot by the things around me and the things that I've experienced in life. Um, the shore, Cape Cod especially, big influence. And hopefully you can see some of that coming through in this work. So these bowls, the one in the two corners, the top left and bottom right corner, um, are what I refer to as Cape Cod bowls. I have sold over the years, hundreds of them, to people in our um, farmer's market, in our community. I like to think that they are influenced by the waves, by the ocean, that that ash and salt work that you see on the pot, especially the one in the lower um, right-hand corner represents dunes and some of the shoreline of the Cape, places like that. I often tell people who don't live in New England, I feel sorry for people who don't live in New England. And um, I mean that, I mean, we are really fortunate. You can get anything in about two and a half hours. You can be in downtown New York City, you can be in Boston, you can almost be in Burlington, Vermont, you can be in the Green Mountains, or you can be in the White Mountains, and it's all very different. We are really fortunate. And one of the most beautiful things, and you see it right outside the door of this studio, are old brick buildings, sometimes uh, encircled with rusty old fences. And I just love to look around and, and see what, how that can inform and, and how we can develop a conversation from some of the things that, uh, that we see in, in our work. And as you can see, hopefully, uh, a rusty old fence has influenced my paddling. That bowl is made with a, a, a roughly uh, sawn pattern that was on a, a wooden paddle. It's thrown high and then it gets smacked pretty hard, put out shape, and then put back into the bowl shape from the inside. So you can't, once you smack it, and put that kind of uh, heavy impression on the outside of the clay. You've got to work only one side of it. So that's really how that is. When I was up at Worcester Center for Crafts, you would get off the highway and drive through the Arts District in Worcester. And much like Putnam, there's a lot of old factories there, which fortunately in the last 10 years, you're seeing a lot of those factories in hill towns throughout New England, like Putnam and certainly um, southwestern Massachusetts being refurbished and repurposed, which is wonderful. But I would look at some of those buildings and the corbeling, which is the ridges that, that are made with brickwork um, on those buildings that are used for beginnings and endings. And I think, how do you transfer that into a pot? How, how, do, you, how do you take what they're doing? They could have made a square box. Instead, they used extra brick. They positioned those bricks in such a way, and they would use that to begin buildings, to end buildings, and to accent buildings through the middle. And over the years, I looked hard to transfer that to different parts of my work. One of the more successful has been, the, for me, what's a pretty standard mug design that has evolved over the last decade or so. It's probably one of the most popular pieces that my clientele seems to enjoy. And it works really well on um, all sorts of different glazes and treatments that I use to decorate pots. It is a challenging piece for me because the proportions and the subtlety of line needs to be right for the pot to have the right feel. Angles off a little bit, um, where, the, where the pot begins to move in and then back out. 
uh, can make a huge difference in how, it, how successful it is. So I still find the form challenging. Three weeks before Christmas, I set myself the task to make a hundred of these, which will all be fired to look like the pot in the lower left-hand corner. That pot is raw clay, heavily salted with a, uh, a high iron and cobalt glaze as the liner. And I love making it. I love firing it. It sells really well. People often comment on how much they enjoy drinking out of it, which what more could you ask for? As, a, as you know, as a potter in that. But it was all influenced by that year and a half or almost two years of getting off the highway and looking at old buildings and saying, how can I transfer that onto my, onto my work? Um, nature paints beautifully, you know. Um, I mentioned Cape Cod already. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Cape, but the outer Cape, there's a place called Head of the Meadow Beach. It's in North Truro. It's one of, it's an interesting place because it's one of the few places on the East Coast that you can watch the sun set over the ocean. Right? So think about that, right? You're watching on the East Coast of the United States, the sun set over the ocean, right? which mm. it's pretty challenging spot, but you can do that ahead of the Meadow Beach. And that's what that, that picture is. Um, and nature in terms of fire and atmosphere and wood ash and salt and iron can paint pots beautifully, just like sky and sun and water and atmosphere can do the same in the sunset. Um, and I love this glaze. This is a, a recipe. It's called Ohada. It's a recipe that I took with me from Worcester. It's nothing I can take any credit for. It's a pretty popular. You can find a lot about it even online. And it reacts really well in my kiln. Uh, it reacts really well in, a, in the design of that kiln. And, and I love what it does. And you can see that it moves from um, a deep maroon to a bright orange, yellowy green, and, and a lot of the colors in between. The pot, the detail of the picture, the picture is also in the, in the uh, as I mentioned already, it's in the gallery here tonight, so you can get a good look at it. The other thing, this um, glaze and, and clay body that it's on reacts really well to is how fast the wood kiln cools. Um, I don't know how many of you here when you're firing like to peak, right? You know, it's okay, it's 700 degrees. Can I just lift it up and see? You've never done that. I'm sure Dad doesn't let you do that. <laughs> but it's not a good thing to do, especially with the atmospheric kiln. Um, if you can allow, uh, allow a kiln to cool really slowly with some glazes, and this is one of them, at, at about 1600 degrees, a process called quartz inversion, when things start to turn from being exothermic to once again being able to absorb heat, you can get crystal growth on the, on the edge. And you would see that on that pot. You'll see, if you took a jeweler's glass, you would actually see growth, growth of crystals in the glaze. It's what actually gives it the blue purple haze on part of that high iron glaze. So it's a complex glaze. I love it. It works well in my kiln. And I probably have pots every fire in there. And it does different things depending on what time of year. It will do a different thing in a kiln in April than it will in November because things cool slower in April than they do in November, especially if it's a windy November day. Um, sometime back, not even that long ago, I was sitting where I usually drink a cup of coffee outside in the morning when it's nice. And I noticed this weed starting to grow up underneath my fence. And I, I went over to yank it out. And I noticed that it had the very beginnings of small little blossoms on it. And I'm not a botanist, but I, I tried to find out what this is. It's some sort of potato weed, I think. So maybe someone knows what it is. But, so I didn't yank it. I just left it to see what it would do. I wondered. And as it got larger, it actually is really pretty. <laughs> and uh, 
And then I noticed how it was really sensitive as a weed, like many grasses that are just natural, it can be sensitive to movement. So if, if the wind were blowing on the fence next to it, there would be movement in the, in the plant. And then even the juxtaposition of the real straight lines of that white fence behind it. And I said, how do I transfer this? How can I, how can I capture some of this? Um, and so that's what really the motif for this grass is all about, the history of it, how it kind of came to be. And, um, I have been developing this motif for a few years now. And I'm actually at a point where I'm trying to pare down. So the one in the, the, the uh, greenware that you see in the, let's see, the upper left hand picture um, is kind of where it's at. And I try to keep it at one or two stems, no more than two flowers. And I try to keep it at five small leaves. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Okay. Doesn't mean every one of them come out really well, but as I'm, as I'm making it, and there are quick marks, right? As you do this on wet clay, as you carve into wet clay, it's quick marks. And um, so I, I'm trying to pare it all down into some of the essentials. Of what we do. There's a wonderful potter out of Wales. His name was uh, Phil Rogers. I don't know if anyone's familiar with his work. He just passed away recently. I knew Phil a little bit and we would communicate. I, I did a workshop with him at the Truro Center for the Arts up in Truro. A really good guy. There's a wonderful film about him online that you can find. And he, he makes a point. He talks about motif. And he's a huge influence on my work in a number of ways. But um, he, makes the, he makes a point about a famous Japanese potter called Soji Hamada. He said he was a genius. He had like a dozen motifs. Most potters get one or two in their life. And I think I'm heading towards my motif. But I hope I get a one or two more before I pack it all in. Right now, this is where it's at. Uh, the teapot again up in the uh, upper right hand corner is in the, in the gallery this evening also. You can see that motif. High iron dark clay with a porcelain slip, just really a cone ten porcelain that will slip down and slip and then carved into the piece with a celadon, green celadon over it that shines through. So uh, you can get some complex surfaces out of wood firing, which is why I fell in love with it. Let's see what else. However, saying all of that about wood firing, I don't want you to think that I do not in any way appreciate cone six electric firing. I do. I have a whole body of work. Um, and that glaze that you see there is called floating blue. Really what it should be called is cash flow blue. <laughs> the old saying, if you can't make it, make it blue. <laughs> People love blue pots. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but people love blue pots. And so I, I have a, a whole line of work. So I, I say never underestimate the power of coffee right, as a potter, never underestimate the power of blue as a potter, uh, and never underestimate the power of helping um, other small businesses, other artists, other people out. So there's a bakery in Ellington called Luann's Bakery, opened up a few years ago. Uh, it's a great spot. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And I think they're being really successful. Um, and I gave them, I don't know at the time, 75 or 100 mugs. I said, look, I want you guys to be successful. Um, I gave them the pots. It was fun making them. I used it as an opportunity to try and make 100 coffee cups that were 8 ounces or 12 ounces or whatever it was we made them. I learned how to use a throwing stick uh, at that point in time. But it's returned tenfold, honestly. Um, people became interested in my work from being there. People now stop at the gallery who somebody said, yeah, he's the guy who made him's right down the street. Here's what you do. Or he's at the farmer's market. Um, there's one thing about throwing pots that I've learned 
potters are nice people. People who throw pots are nice people. And I've talked to pot potters all over the country. Um, I mentioned the kiln that we built before I built that kiln. I traveled all around North Carolina and talked to different potters thinking, What's, what style do I want to make? How big do I want to make it? What kind of work do I make? And people just took you in and they stopped what they were doing. Even people who, that's all they do is they're studio potters. They don't give classes and don't have a studio. And that's how they make their livelihood. Sometimes if you're there, they'll ask you to help blaze pots, but that's okay. I'm learning something when you do that. But I really found that all, all around the country, people who spell pots are, are good people. I would encourage if you do that, buy some of their work too, right? That, that's, that's for sure. So um, anyway, cone six, big part of what I do as well. Again, it's not all about wood fire, but we will talk about wood firing and Muddy Brook Kiln. So as I mentioned, this kiln is, is about 70 cubic feet. I had a small version of this kiln for 10 years. Um, it, it's only, that, that was only 16 cubic feet. It was, the floor of it was about table height. And um, I had to do like advanced yoga poses at times to fill that count, okay? Now, as I told you what year I graduated high school, you know that I should no longer in this point in my life be doing advanced yoga. So um, the biggest design paradigm I had is I wanted to be able to walk into this kiln. I want to walk into it. I don't want to have to bend over. I don't want to have to stretch. I don't want to do anything. So the inside of that kiln is, a, is about uh, six foot five inside. So I can walk right in there. I can place pots on the high shelf. And, and I'm the floor. You've all, um, none of us have done wood fire at Worcester. Have you? Okay. Yeah, most of us have. Many of us have. So what's the size of that kiln in relationship to this kiln? So that kiln is 16 cubic feet. The okay. first kiln I had was that kiln. Okay. So it's called the Peg Udall Design. If you ever look at the book, um, Wood Fired Stoneware and Porcelain, the detailed plans for that kiln at Worcester is in that book. And Tom O'Malley helped me build it a bit, a bit when, he, when we were there together. Um, so if you, if you work there, you know what I mean, where you're, you're you know, especially you get up top and you've got to like really stretch you just point to david david does all that stuff right well, david's young enough to do that but i'm no longer young enough to do that. so um, i i wanted to, but it's exactly the same design so it's a catenary arch um if we weren't online and we were having a little more interaction i'd ask does anybody know what the what a catenary arch the, 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 it's a it's a beautiful thing it's a force of nature so catenary arch is made pretty simply, you take how big you want, how wide you want it, how high you want it, you flip it upside down and you drop a chain from those two points to that point. And the natural arch that forms by that chain is called a catenary arch, okay? So you can, it can be, a catenary arch can be any dimension because it's, it's the natural force of gravity. The wonderful thing about a catenary arch is it's also self-supported. So you don't need any buttressing. So if you go to like up, up the street here, I saw there's a cathedral up the street. Any, any other arch type needs buttressing. Either it's got to go way down into the ground or you've got to build spires to buttress that thing so it doesn't collapse on itself. Candary arch actually falls down and supports itself. There's no mortar on that, on those bricks. It's dry stacked. Um, What's, there's a skim covering that covers some blankets just so that you don't, uh, so you retain heat. But it's a beautiful thing of nature and mathematics. So it's about, what is that, six times, four, six, four to five times larger than the Worcester film. I used to be able to put about 110 pieces in the 16 cubic foot. Um, this kiln will take 300 to 350 pieces of my work. So um, that's a whole different, a different thing as well. Let me stop there. Any other comments, questions about anything we've talked about? I'm going to shift into what the processing of wood fire is 
or David or Bob, anything I should cover that I didn't would be helpful. Okay, well, if there's any questions on that. A couple things about throwing pots. If, if some of you are going to um, join us, I, and I hope you do for the firing in April. Um, a wood kiln, there's some violence in a wood kiln, right? So your heat and cooling cycles are more dramatic than you would get in a, in a controlled, like a, a gas or even an oil fire kiln, and certainly a, an electric kiln. So you can, you can rise in temperature and then somebody doesn't pay attention and you've dropped 300 degrees. And that does some things to the work. So plates, for example, if you make plates for a wood fire, you would probably want to take the foot ring and make it significantly wider than you would for an electric fire. You would want to, um, and another reason that I, I think, at least for me, fire, Throwing on a treadle wheel helps is you're not putting the stress into the material that you do on an electric wheel. So it's slower, you're controlling more of the forces against that material, which helps uh, with warpage. Plates are a whole discussion in themselves if you're going to use them in a wheel. Ease, being easy on the material and being a little wider with the foot and thinking about the, the end of your rim, right? maybe a little thicker, also can help. Where you wouldn't, at least I didn't, and don't necessarily think about it if I'm throwing for mid-fire or electric fire. Other thoughts? Any questions from online back then? Okay. Is there any particular shapes that you like to, that you prefer to throw in a wood fire? Like I tend to do more holes for some reason? Yeah, great. No, it's a great question. Um, one of the things I would really encourage you to think about is think about edges. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're firing in a kiln, and especially this, this type of kiln. Fire is over here, it goes up the arch, and the, the flame, including the ash from the wood, falls on your pots like snow. Okay. Water and snow, think water and snow. So wood ash, if you have a, 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 a small edge, let me see if I'm gonna back up. You want me to grab a piece from the gallery too, you can't really run them up. Say it again? You want me to grab any of your pieces from the gallery? That's all right, I think I need to. But it, if you look at the uh, edges of, again, I'll point to the wood-fired cup on the left, lower left, um, a lot of what you're seeing in that glaze that runs down, the color is coming from wood ash, right? So you, that'll get a buildup of wood ash right on the lip. And then uh, obviously when the temperature gets up, wood ash melts. There actually is enough silica in wood that it will melt into glass at about 2,000 degrees. Yeah. Dot. Uh, so parents are locked. I'd like to know if you add salt for me. So great question. Um, yes, I add salt. I do not use burritos. So parents' questions about salting, those of you who have salt fired, is a lot of people will take newspaper put salt in, it's just regular kosher table salt, fold that up into a burrito and then toss the burrito into the, into the fire, which kind of explodes into a cloud of sodium gas. I do it a little different. Um, I take a, an, an angle iron, a long piece of angle iron, and I fill that angle iron with salt. I slide that in First, I load the firebox with wood so there's a lot of wood on the grate so it doesn't all fall right into the coal bin. And then I spread that across the, uh, the wood. So I enjoy that better. 
that's number one. And two, I have found over the course of my firing is that it seems to hit blaze pieces with less force and I get less running in this kiln when I don't use burritos, instead I use, and I will do that about six to eight times between cone eight and cone, I'm sorry, between now cone seven and cone nine, around cone eight is when I, when I saw it. When I saw it. Less, running? Yeah. less running, yeah. It doesn't seem to run the glaze quite as much. That's a great question. Um, well, I was just going to say, while well, you're on that, yep. that mug that you can point to has that like plastic orange peel texture on it. Can you, I know we have students, um, Ellen, be one of them that loves that. Can you explain what causes that? Is so? Right. So, um, what's happening when that, that orange peel texture? that David just asked about is on that same cup, that cup to the lower left of this picture. <laughs> my, my other left, not this left, this left, um, the lower left. And again, that is just sodium that then mixes um, or adheres to the piece. So that, that pot has nothing on it that is raw clay. It's actually a clay body. Um, out of Sheffield Potters. I know you use a lot of Amherst and Laguna and Rusty Kiln, I think, here. Um, I'm pretty close to Sheffield, so I, I use a couple of their bodies, their clay bodies. So there's nothing on there at all. And all that is, is the effects of that sodium um, and wood ash on that pot. In, in a certain place in the kiln, so that piece was, what you see was fired uh, perpendicular to the flame, probably pretty close to the bag wall, right? Or else with a pretty direct line, because two things happened here is you, you had a lot of ash on that piece, and then you got a pretty good amount of, of, of salt. In this kiln, and I've, I'm on my seventh firing on this recent kiln, so it's a couple years old. Um, I lost my train of thought, forgive me. Oh, I use about nine to 10 pounds of salt. So I've played with that a little bit. I actually think I probably would be more successful if I put a firing in that was all for, for salt firing and increase that. But it's not how I make work, so I haven't done that yet. <laughs> no, that worked. I was talking to Tom about it. Yep. And he was saying that if you were to have a clay body that had more coarse silica, it would do more of that orange peel. Have you ever? Oh, that's a great point. I, that I don't know. But I'm telling you what, I, I would never question time. So, <laughs> <laughs> truly, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. He, uh, so, yeah, that would, and, and of course, it would make some sense because it would give more, more adhesion to the sodium than to the gases that it's going through. I have a picture later on of, of what happens when we salt fire this kiln. Um, the other thing, I don't know if, if you've if you've used Shinos here much. Have you talked much about Shinos? No. Those that are fired at work, but yeah. So okay, so and there are people literally who spend their life working with Shino glazes. The uh, pot. I can't point to anything because I don't know where it is to point to, but the uh, the gray the gray pot that you see there, mug that you see, that is a carbon trapped Shino mug. Um, the, the set of them came out of the very first firing I had of this new kiln, and I was so excited. I love carbon trapped work, and uh, I've never been able to get anything close to it since, so I don't know. It was a fluke. <laughs> and I can tell you, my youngest daughter bought it the minute it came out. She said, Those are mine. I'm paying it. I don't <laughs> She still has them. I said, How did I ever be willing to give that up? Okay, I'll keep going. Sorry to back up a little bit. So, 
wood firing, the other thing about wood firing, again, if you fired up in Worcester, this some of you will know. Um, if not, uh, it is not a, a single person operation. So you see four people there, that's um, four people who are pretty steady uh, firing crew. Um, one's a, a close friend, one's a son-in-law, grandson, and another close friend. So it usually takes four people about this time. The gentleman in the back, who's my son-in-law, Andrew, is really good at this. He's got a good feel for firing wood. And he is watching two blowholes, which is a gauging atmosphere, pressure in the kiln, how much oxygen is getting through, and when he will call for somebody to stoke again. And so he was there watching, and he would say, okay, Steve, who is in the front, Steve Stoke, or if he notices there's a difference between front and back of the kiln, he will ask the, the Wade who's in the back of the kiln to, to fire. Uh, uh, a friend of mine named Carol Crohan, a wonderful artist in, up in Tolland, um, a painter, uh, Carol Expressions on Instagram. She loves to come and fire. And she's like many artists, is uh, a night hawk. So she, Carol will usually show up around midnight and man the, uh, what we call the mouse holes, the purpose of which is just to feed the coal bed because that's really what burns those logs when you shove them in there at a pretty high rate. So it takes, it takes a community to fire wood kill like this. Um, and I'm just really fortunate that I have a lot, of, a lot of good people who fire. But there's a lot of work to wood firing and you better love every single step because you better like being outside the cold weather and splitting wood. That's my grandson, Connor, who split all that wood and then stacked it off for me. Um, this past year, we had some trees taken down. It's maple. I do like to fire with a combination of maple and pine is what I try to use. I do use a little bit of oak or other hardwoods to build up a coal bed. But overall, I seem to like the effects of maple and pine better. And you can find lots of discussions about what different types of wood do in, in wood firing. First of all, I have a lot of it and easy access to those two woods, so it's good. Uh, lots of cone packs and rings that you pull out of a wood fire after you salt and then before you decide when to salt again, you're pulling rings out of the fire just to see how much is adhering, and how much orange peel there is. And do you want more or do you feel you've got enough in there? So that's what those rings are there for, cone packs and trees are familiar with. I look at wood firing and one of the reasons why I love it so much is it is rhythmic and you, I spend a couple of months in a making cycle. I then, and I'll, I'll bisque, in between, but most of it, so just before Christmas, I started a making cycle. I will make now and work until probably mid-March, maybe the end of March. And then I will go into probably a two or three week uh, glaze or decorating cycle. Some of these pots that you've seen and some in the gallery obviously are decorated as uh, leather hard pieces because that's when they're carved. Um, so some of it is not that uh, binary, but there's, it's pretty much a, a making and then a glaze decorating and then a lot of prep. And prep is low, is from splitting wood, hopefully more stacking wood, making wadding, um, Again, if you've wood fired, you know that you need to put high refractory material on the foot of your pots so that it doesn't adhere to the kiln shell. Um, you can use wadding as decoration, which um, a lot of wood fired potters will do, especially if you have a, a kiln that is designed for velocity of flame. This kiln is not designed for velocity of flame. But if you see pictures of like long streaks, almost look like comets on a, on a platter or something like that, that's a high velocity kiln, mostly an anagama, a long 
tube-shaped kiln where the flame is horizontally moving through the work. As I said, this kiln goes, this flame goes up the kiln and falls like water through the pots. It doesn't blast through with high velocity through pots. So you design for that, you make for it. Um, and then I usually take about three days to load this kiln. Now, some of that's just because I'm really inefficient and <laughs> move things around and pull things out. And sometimes I'm alone. So you could probably load the kiln if you had a team of people, and probably a good long day. But it's 350 pots to get ready and line up and find the right spot for and think about, well, I want a real high orange peel effect here, or no, I don't. Can we put this somewhere? Or this really, this glaze really takes the heat. And this glaze, can we put in a cooler spot in the can? So you're thinking about things like that, which I find fascinating and fun. It's all part of the process. I mentioned it. Um, oh, so this picture, this uh, I, one of the gentleman who fires with me is one of our fire, firing crew. His wife got up one morning in our last firing, which was just this past October, I think. When was it, David? October, November? Anyway. Yeah. And um, she got, went up on her porch and she saw this big trail of smoke that you see in that picture. That is the Muddy Brook kiln when we were salted. It's actually not smoke, it's actually salt. So my point of the picture is, Make sure you get along with the people in your neighborhood. <laughs> or else do this in the middle of the night. So um, there are a couple of times where a big pool of white smoke will come out. And there are other times where a huge plume of thick black smoke will come out when we do um, a reduction. So the cycle, the actual cool, uh, neat part of the whole thing is when you're firing the kiln. So the way we fire the Muddy Brook kiln is we will preheat the kiln. So once we load it, we Brick up the front door. Um, I usually use propane. You can start a small campfire, but I'll just stick a, a propane uh, burner in there on just a low flame. It won't get any higher than 200 or so, 250 degrees. And I'll do that for about eight hours. So if I start at midnight, I usually come out then around four in the morning and I'll start a campfire a little bit of a wood fire right behind that propane. And that begins to build up a cold bed, just like you would for a barbecue. Somewhere around three to four hours later, I'll turn the propane off, put that away. And at that point in time, you can no longer leave that fire. You've got to feed that fire and you've got to take care of it. And so you build it up slowly um, and I'll spend the next 10 hours or so just building the heat up until we get to cone 010, which is about 1800 degrees. Actually, I, what I'll do is when the, the hottest part of the kiln reaches cone 010 or about 1825 degrees, which means other parts of the kiln are still probably 150 degrees cooler than that, earlier than that we will do what's called a body reduction, which means we now will overfeed the kiln with fuel. Um, it, that's when you get a huge plume of black smoke. We will overfeed fuel. We will damper the thing down. So what's happening now is the fire is choking out. It wants to burn. So it's actually burning the oxides in the clay body itself. It's actually taking the oxides out of the clay body to feed the fire. And that's where you get um, that beautiful flashing and gold and dark browns and reds and orangey kind of flashing that you get in a wood fire. It starts to come from that body reduction. In this kiln, I do about 30 to 40 minutes and, and then open it all up let the flame burn out, clean it out, get high oxygen, nice uh, um, open air through the kiln. And I think, I, I feel it sets kind of that flashing in at that point. 
From then on, it's just a long process of slowly building heat throughout the kiln. Um, when I get to about cone seven, I make a decision. Is do we want to keep firing and just kind of finish? Or do I want to sit there for a few hours? A lot of potters, especially wood-fired potters who want to get real flashing effects, will, will soak the kiln. They'll just stay at 2200, 2300 degrees for six, eight extra hours just to let that process of ash build up and reduction, alternating with oxidation of the kiln, they'll just let that happen at that temperature. So it's one of the decisions. As I said, I get to cone eight, we start to think about salting. I usually do that over a period of two to three hours. I'll do about three pounds at a time, then let things go, pull rings, let that melt, let it work through the kiln, build up a few more degrees of temperature and do it again and then do it again about an hour later. So I, I salt around cone seven to cone eight for, um, as I say, about three times and we use about 10 pounds, nine to 10 pounds of salt. Somewhere in that cone nine temperature, you need to decide whether you wanna reduce glazes or not. So if some glazes, selenons, for example, will react really well. So again, going through a reduction where you're starving the kiln of oxygen so that things that oxides in the glazed body get, get used to feed the heat. Another question. Um, Dale is asking, does soaking help with crystal development? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I've always been under the understanding that most of the time that happens in the cooling cycle, but I don't really know the answer. I, don't, I can't say that for sure. It's a great question, though. You should know that. What glazes would not like the reduction? What glazes would not like, like the glaze reduction? Yeah, rutiles, I don't know. I, I find any kind of glaze with a rutile. I, in my smaller kiln, I use a blue rutile yeah. glaze recipe. I think you and I talked about it, David, that um, it was beautiful. I cannot get it to work in my, in my new kiln. I would feel like really insecure about that, except that years ago, I took a, a workshop from a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Davis. Some of you may remember <laughs> Malcolm Davis. He was really a great guy, character. And uh, he had just built a new kiln and his whole thing was carbon trap shimas and he couldn't get it to the new kiln. So I was really glad I knew that because it really helped me in my insecurity. <laughs> if you ever read books at all about any of this please read the book art and fear ever read it anybody ever read the book oh any artist you've got to it's it's like a hundred pages and it's all about our fears and insecurities as artists and the whole creative process and whether or not it's accepted who accepts it um, so anyway if you don't take anything else away from tonight it's, it's a cheap little book, it's a, and it's a wonderful little book of essays around the insecurities and fears of producing art. It's a wonderful read. Um, so you have to decide about glaze reduction. I'm going to try and find out the answer to that question. Thanks for asking it. Um, and then it's really just a final heat rise to where you want to go, cone nine, cone 12. I mentioned cone 12 because this kiln, because I will fire to where the top of this kiln, remember I, I talked about how that flame goes up along the arch. So the heat is at the top. We will get to cone 12. It's not that I like to get to cone 12. I actually don't, like to get to cone 12, but it, it's a macho thing. You know, people like to get to cone 12. <laughs> Yeah, but sometimes that's not good. I have a lot of problems with those. Um, but if in this kiln, the top will get to cone 12. The very back lower corner will get to cone nine. Right. Most of the rest of the kiln is in the cone 10 range. So I've been able to fire fairly evenly with a really hot spot and what we call a cool spot. 
If you look at the Orton chart, you're talking a whole, you're talking about like 150 degrees difference. You're not talking a lot. It's amazing what happens at those, at those temperatures. It's a wonderful thing. It's a mystery. And for me, what's really great about wood firing is you can, you can do everything right. You can do everything the same. You can even load it pretty much the same. And you still have a, you, you have a measure of control and predictability, but there's a pretty good measure of synchronicity and serendipity that happens. So you, you know a little bit. Um, and then once we get to temperature, um, I will down fire for a while. I don't, some people really like to down fire their kiln over the course of X number of hours to four, you know, 1400 degrees, 1600 degrees. I, I haven't done that. I have down fired to maybe uh, 1900 degrees, somewhere in there. Mostly, uh, I think I'm doing that to kind of brighten color. I think that's what's happening. There's also a big whole discussion about reduction cooling that's happening in, in the industry. And I know Zippo about it, haven't yet tried to do it. And it's my next workshop sometime. So. But you got to want the aesthetic because I don't know that everybody. So that's kind of the 36 to 38 hour firing process. Now that's the preheat period. So it's really a 26 to 30 hour process of actually working with wood. So is reaching 212 what you meant by burning your first pot? Uh, no, burning my first, first pot when I said that early on, you mean? I was talking about just burning it, burning wood, just with wood. It just, oh. I just love the process of, of firing with wood. Oh, that. Um, the other phase of the cycle is the cleanup cycle. You gotta love it. All right, it is as much a part of success <laughs> as everything else. Um, again, cooling down slowly. Um, I have developed or trying to develop more and more of the habit and process that we actually take the door down, we clean the area up, we let the pots sit in the shelf, and then we look at the pots. So what can you learn? What happened in the, in the firing? What is it showing you by just what you can see before you start taking pots out? Because once you start taking pots out, you, know, you start to look at them, forget, right? You're excited, you're disappointed, you're destroyed, you know, all those kinds of um, and, you know, you've got a lot of uh, furniture and then you have shelves to scream. So all that salt that got on your pot also gets on your shelf and that has to be scraped off with everything from a wire brush to a, one of the most dangerous shop tools you can use, which is a grinding machine. Um, and then what I like to do is clean up the area and actually stack wood for the next firing so that I'm not, that wood is stacked before I start making again. So that's kind of the, the process, if you will, um, of firing with wood. If you are uh, coming to fire with us, I have five rules. They're pretty easy. It's be safe, respect the other people that are there, respect everybody's work that's there, right? Respect the kiln and the fire. And what I mean about the respecting the fire isn't necessarily just being safe around the fire. Um, I mean, respecting it. I don't throw, I, I don't throw my potato chip bag in my wood kiln. I, I understand it probably wouldn't make a iota of difference, but I don't throw my potato chip bag in, in the wood fire. I got a trash can out there for trash. This is not an incinerary for my trash. Or anybody else, it's for me. So I mean, respect respect what's happening. What is what is it you can learn as you're watching that fire hit pots? Um, one of the most favorite pots I had of our out of our last firing, um, I watched that pot 
because it was right in front of a spy hole. I watched the ash build up on it. I watched the pattern of the flame hit it. I actually watched the glaze crawl, which broke my heart, by the way, but it actually came out nice. Right? And so what did I learn? What do I take away from what the fire had to teach? And that's what I mean. So learn, learn what we can learn and, and have fun with doing it. And that's it. Um, which I actually overspent the time a little bit, so forgive me for that. But questions? Anything again? Have you ever done warming as decoration for something? Have I ever done warming as decoration? Yes, I, I sure have. Um, in fact, there's a set of square plates out there that um, those have a couple of glazes on them, kind of my graffiti work, they call it. But, um, you actually would see some wad marks in between some of that glaze. And um, I will do a whole series of plates stacked on one another. And one of the reasons I do that, that what can happen in this kiln, especially if you're over towards the bag wall and the flame is, is it, and you can catch it, it can get pulled in across the pots if they're stacked. Um, so let's talk a little bit about wadding. You asked about wadding. So yes, I do do that. You can do it in this kiln. What I would encourage is I use a recipe, um, which I got from a gentleman by the name of Potter, by the name of Simon Lem Levin, who does a lot of wadding decoration work, which is basically a third of sand, construction level sand, a third wood chips, you know, like you buy for bedding for your pet rabbits, um, and, uh, and a fire clay, like a hawthorn bond. And it makes a beautiful wadding and it doesn't leave a white residue behind. Wadding I use for posts in the shelving work is basically tile six and, and alumina hydrate at about a 60, 40, 60 tile six, 60% 60 tile six, 40% alumina. And that alumina hydrate leaves a white film on the wadding. You, you can't get away. Just does. So we have two wadding recipes that you're welcome to use if you come fire with us. And one of them worked great for decorative, decorative placement. It's a great question. When you load the kiln um, and you have a group of people that come down, do you separate the glazes that everybody uses? Because certain parts of the kiln make it look different. Like you were saying before, when you put a piece here, because I know it's going to be this, put it over here because I know the salt's going to be here. So when you load it, do you load it as a separate entity of each glaze color, or do you just put it all? No, that's, I wish I was that smart. I wish I was that organized. You know, that's a great idea. It's not me. Um, we'll load by size. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, yep. and then we'll say, okay. So this is a that Ohada high iron glaze. If we put it here, it's gonna. It's definitely gonna get salt. It's gonna get hit with flame. Great, it goes there. If somebody said, look, I've got this, this blue glaze, it's got lots of cobalt in it, I would say, let's, let's put this back away from the kiln. There's a, actually a side stack in this kiln. So there's a place that works well for glazes, especially if, if the glazes mature well in the cone eight, cone nine to 10 range. There's a, yeah. there's a nice section of this kiln that seems to be working out pretty well for that. So yeah, we, more, we more load by size. Another question, Doc? Um, this is not on the fire, but um, more of a question was, can you tell us more about mint and inspiration for the gallery? Oh, the name of the gallery and inspiration? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. So, look, you've all been potters, right? Who, who, who took your first pot? And was like really excited and wanted it. Who did that? Your mother. Your mother. <laughs> of course. So Midge was my mother. <laughs> Passed away a number of years ago. She would have been 99 this year, right? And she loved my pots. Let me just tell you. So a friend of mine and I, when the pot comes out of the pot, comes out of the kiln. One of my a guy named Steve Hoffman, who's a fellow potter, who's just down the street. He, he's 
a good friend and he's really mechanically smart and a lot of the things that work in my kiln come from him and he fires with us there. We, we always teach each other, if something comes out really bad, he says, well, mom will buy it. <laughs> so it was only right that I named the gallery after my mom, right? Yeah. That's who Midge was. So. Thanks for asking. Anything else? Well, so I talked about- Have you had students come before? Um, well, first of all, um, like no. what we're proposing, have you done this before? Um, no, yeah. I have not, okay. Um, and as I said, what, what happened was, I think they're not able because of COVID and even some of the things going on in Worcester um, to do, to open up their wood kiln for you. So I happened to stop there one day because I was having trouble with the blue teal recipe. And I needed <laughs> to talk to Tom O'Malley. I, I got this problem. And he says, hey, by the way, he says, do you know these sawmill pottery over in Putnam? I said, no. I said, They're really great people. They really would like to do a firing. Would you at all be open to, I said, well, do they know what they're doing? Oh yeah, Dot really knows what she's doing. He, says, right? he really like, he really promotes Dot. <laughs> David, he never said anything about David. <laughs> no, he, he spoke very highly of uh, of your community here. And so he made an introduction over email. Now, I talked a lot about relationships, I hope through the evening. Um, I don't, I, I, as I said, I, I sell at a farmer's market in town and I'm not exaggerating when I say three out of four weeks a month, someone asks if I give lessons and I don't. I just, I'm, I'm not really interested in sharing my studio space. But I really love people. Right? You can tell I'm really shy and introverted. <laughs> right? So the opportunity to find a community, and I said to Dot, look, you bring your folks over. If it works for you, great. If it works for me, great. And you know, hopefully it's a long way for you to go. It's a 45 minute drive, um, maybe even a little more. But if it works, great. I am pretty laid back, truthfully. Right? We respect people, we respect what's going on. As I said, have fun. I probably would rather people don't drink while they're on fire, while they're stoking, right? So I don't, there are a lot of wood party, potters who make it a party scene. I'm not really into that. So I need to, you know, have a few beers after, that's your job. Okay. Yeah, Tom doesn't either, so. Yeah. What's that? Tom doesn't. Yeah, that's right, he, he, he doesn't. Yeah. Right. And as I said, there's no one that's probably influenced me more. So, um, but we have a lot of fun and we get a lot of people there and, you know, high school kids from my family. We, we do an annual firing um, most years on Labor Day and we have a picnic at the same time. And I'm not exaggerating, but there'll be a hundred plus people that'll come through, grab some food, stoke some, we'll kill them for a while. And, just kind of hang out. Last, uh, the last time we did that before COVID hit, two of my high school teachers showed up. You know, just, oh, that's good. Yeah, it's just, I've had people that I went to high school with that I hadn't seen, like pull in the yard and know I was there and what was going on. So I, I really hope it works for your, your folks here. And nothing else, we'll have fun and learn some things. So. Absolutely. I expect it personally. Um, is there any there, like, do you have any ideas or visions for uh, ways that you want to move your work or do experiments in the firing? Like, just I'm just saying, thinking about like looking to the future, is there anything for you personally that you're like, oh, I really want to experiment with this, or I want my work to go in this direction? Do you have any thoughts? No, it's a great question. Yes. Um, number one, um, I'm not really a decorator, right? So wood firing works well for me because the, the fire is meant to do that. Now, having said that, let me, let me caveat. I think um, certainly at a point in time, I would say, oh, this pot, I don't really like this pot. It's kind of a marginal pot. 
but maybe it'll come out good in the wood fire, right? It'll get all ashy and all that. You know what? If the bones of the pot aren't good, it's not going to be good. Either. So, so I really am trying to focus on building this, my skill set and and making um, really good work. That's number one. Two. Um, I mentioned the motif, the, the field grass motif. I, I would like to, I would like to develop some other motifs that are, that are, um, that will identify my work. I can say that. Like somebody, like I looked at that mug over there earlier, and I said to myself, "That's Nick Jerling's mug, right? You know, you know Nick Jerling's work. You know his work. And if you look at potters of that caliber." They pair them, they pair themselves down. Their glazed palette is minimal. Their forms are, are similar. So that's the direction I'm, I'm trying to go in. At the same time, it needs to work in that kiln that I've spent a lot of time and effort um, putting out there. And then um, so that that's that's kind of I should talk about this kiln, by the way. I, I mentioned that the first kiln, Tom and myself and a gentleman by the name John Bernard, a friend of mine, is also a potter. Three of us built that kiln together. And I learned I didn't want to ever do that again. <laughs> I, I, I did not ever want to build it. So I contacted a woman by the name of Julie Crosby, who's a wonderful potter out of uh, Utica, New York. She's also a great kiln builder. And I emailed her. I didn't know Julie. I said, Julie, I heard of you. And she does sell her work at the gift shop at, at Worcester Center. She did a residency there. And Julie, I mentioned earlier that potters are just really nice people. So I emailed Julie back and forth. And I said, OK, would you design? help me design this? We got through that. I said, Julie, I don't want to build this kiln. Would you build it? So she said, well, yeah, I, it, it'll take about three to four weeks. I said, okay, fine. So I made this arrangement and then said to my wife, who's not an extrovert, I said, I'm hiring this woman, Julie Crosby, to build this kiln. Okay. And she's coming to live with us for a month. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I'm leaving on a business trip while she's here. So that tells you the, the caliber of a woman that I married to. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, really, I'm really fortunate and blessed. She set you up a tent outside on your Yeah, show. no, she she actually found herself a, a new friend. She's a wonderful person. And we just had a blast the month she was there. She was great to have her own. I wish she were closer, but the fire works. So I thought I'd just also just tell you about the conversation that went on at the very beginning about your weeds or your your weeds. Um, apparently it's called Lady's Thumb. Lady's Thumb. Yeah, it's, uh, Trisha says it's Lady's Thumb. Edible, it tastes peppery in case you want to put it in salad. Um, no kidding. Wow. Anyway, so thank you for that. That's and then point. Gail added it with oriental lady thumb or creeping knotweed. Um, and then uh, Karen Durlaka said um, it's a variety, the grass plant is a variety of smart weed. Ah. Well, thank you. Um, and can you do me a favor? Can you like copy and paste that? part of that conversation and uh, capture it for me. Oh, I will yeah, never yeah. remember this. I screenshot it. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll, I'll take charge. So I was going to ask you, do you, like sometimes, um, I don't know if you, um, potters will have like a, kind of a smaller kiln to see how the glaze comes out. But I think you already answered the question. I was going to ask, do you use your smaller one to test something, but then you can't always replicate. So yeah. it really kind of voided that out. So I do have a small electric yeah. test kiln. Right, which is still useful in a lot of ways. You can at least see what heat's going to happen. So one of the uh, unintended consequences of built, so I built this big kiln and it really, it's allowed me to throw bigger work, build bigger work. It's, I, I've been really successful with a set of long, am I saying the word right? Chartou, charcuterie? Yeah, that word. Uh, trays. Um, long, so they're like 25 inches and they're 
about nine inches wide and they're hand built. And, I, and actually the, there was a, a uh, jury show by a Potter couple out of um, Scotland in uh, the, wood, the, the wood fired museum down in Seagrove. Anyway, one of those was uh, selected for that show and, and sold. Nice. <laughs> but I, nice. Right? So, uh, but I, I've been really successful with them. I could never have done that right before. So it's allowed me to expand my- That's a good commercial piece. It's a restaurant. Yeah. 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 However, it also though, I wish I had another potter close by who had a 16 cubic foot small fast fire kiln that I could say, hey, can I throw this you know me in your firing and see what happens? Because I have to now really plan out my experiments. So I want to start building some work around what's known as a nuca glaze, which is really a simple formula. Usually it's 50% uh, wood ash and 50% like Cornish stone or some silica based stone. So I put a bunch of small Unomis teacups in, in the last firing. Only one of them came out good. So I sure am glad I didn't you know, put a dozen bowls in there. But now it's six months before I really get to fire things with that. So I have to really plan what I want to experiment and how I want to build the knowledge base. Frankly, from a selfish point of view, having a community like yourselves who are interested in wood firing allows me to fire that kiln more often. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say, right? I'm not, I mean, I hope I'm a nice guy, but I'm just not like completely altruistic. <laughs> <laughs> There's something for me in this too. So, yeah. so let me ask, when you, I, if I remember, you had a smaller uh, wood kiln like the one at Worcester Center Crafts. That no longer exists. At it all. does not. Okay. I, that's it why I think not. I was wondering Sorry, do you fire in that smaller size to see? But I think you had already said that what you have, what could happen in that one did not happen in the larger one. Yeah. Or you can't replicate it yet. Yeah. <laughs> I will, though. I'll of course you will. Yeah. 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 So. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling anxious about the amount of time I'm taking away from you. So, you, taking away? No, no. Uh, oh this is like the biggest thing people have done in months. <laughs> yeah, right. I guess there is that too. It's not like you have any else already. Right? You're going to go home. <laughs> Touche. Any other thoughts? So, the glazes that you offer, right? Because right? you offer them, or is Doc and David, are you guys going to have the glazes we use, or is he going to have the glazes we use? I think we're going to have them. And we're going to glaze. Isn't that what we do? We we're did. gonna work on those details. That's yeah. different from what's the center. I only asked that because I was gonna say next, whatever glazes we have, I kind of I would like to know something about it so that we can look it up. Like I mean, like when I had asked him, where does it go? What does it do? So I can make a piece according to that glaze. We'll so probably we'll use um, get all the recipes from okay. the that was so then mm -hmm. you're using glaze that you're familiar with. Yep. Um, that we we can use in the past, and then we have Kevin has other recipes that he. It doesn't mind sharing and that he feels. Oh, no, no, well. I feel welcome to my recipe book. Right? Mm -hmm. We'll also have those too, but um, that would probably been super giving about those recipes. So yep. that's probably where we'll start, like four of his recipes or something like that. We definitely want to glaze here. Yeah, but I think they're going to go there and load and it's going to take all day. Right, right. I think I like that. It's going to be here with the glazing so that we can really look at it and right. study so yeah. ask you guys more in depth because I always felt that when we went to Worcester, we were rushing to make sure yeah. we had the time frame. So that's great. Good. Yeah, I will I will tell you that one of the things I have, so a couple things in this, in the point of this conversation about rushing, I try hard at this point not to do that anymore. In fact, my last few fire. I actually haven't a hard scheduled fire. And I said, okay, it'll be sometime the end of whatever. And that's part of the reason. I, I hated that. I hated that bum rush to the, to the end. So, now, you may not be able to avoid that. I, I recognize that. So, 
here's one thing I would offer. So if you're going to work with God and, and David, you don't need to worry about making enough pots to fill this. Make pots that you're interested in making. Make Bring pots that you feel confident with. Don't, don't try and make 20 pots just to make 20 pots. If you want to make 15 pots and focus on, I will have enough pots to fill the rest of them. Okay. Fair enough? Yeah. So that takes some pressure off of you as a group. You don't have to, oh, man, we're going to be there in six weeks, and we got to come up with 300 pots. You don't have to do that. I will have enough to fill in. You can have as much room as you want, and then I have one set of plates that I've I have a really good customer who really asked me to make it for him. So I will need room for 12 plates. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, they should have some of them. So there's really not even quite a big limit, right? What, so to speak? That's right. All right, I have a question from Rebecca McMahon. Who says, have you been able to fire the blue, green, or blaze in your time? She's setting me up for that question. I She's it. setting me up for that question. Rebecca is a good friend of mine for many, many years. And uh, so there's an Aribe blaze. You can tell her that I got really close in my last firing, really close. I got the color back, what I, but it ran some, right? Yeah. Um, she has a teapot of mine that I still regret selling to her. <laughs> <laughs> she could double her money by getting it back to me. Um, oh, she's saying no. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's it's a standard of rebate glaze. It's a beautiful glaze. And it it goes everywhere from translucent green to this turquoise. And it is all about thickness and atmosphere. And then an assault firing, if it gets not blasted, it's it's a gorgeous blaze. It's just it's just it's gorgeous. And it's that blaze and, and the blue routile that I'm still working on getting back. So that's why I'm really glad I ran into Malcolm Davis and he said, you know, it makes you know somebody that good and that famous. If he had trouble, it's okay then. <laughs> it's like Simon and his that train killing he built, yeah. it, it's different than the Anagami he had up there in Wisconsin. Yeah. I did a workshop, a two-week workshop with Simon in Penland a couple of years ago. Um, we got into that. We made a lot of work. That class made a lot of work. We fired a lot of pots. I mean, I, I haven't worked that hard since I was a kid. <laughs> but I learned a lot from them. Is that in Maryland? North Carolina. It's a it's a wonderful place. If you ever have the opportunity to go, they do week, two weeks, and eight week workshops. If you want, it's wicked expensive, but it's uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I hope to do it again someday. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you, I'm Dot, and all, and and David. And, I don't know if Heather's still here, or, uh, but, but I really want to thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I hope you found it at least worthwhile. For those that were online, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe and warm. warm. Warm is the key word today, isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, I'm heading to Key West tomorrow. Good for oh. you. Oh. Wow. And me. And me a little bit. Uh, it wasn't warm. <laughs> but yes, it was. You gotta get going. You got a trip now. I'm good. Are you back? Yeah. 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 So I'm gonna ask my mother where we were. Yeah. Hopefully, when I see you. Well, if you're down to the airport. Yeah, well, we have to be because that's where all the jumpers were. Yeah. That's all I remember. I can remember the road. You know, <laughs> Grab your chair, right? Yeah, all right. Yeah, there you are. Put your chair away. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Great job.
call from yet. Uh, it's hard. Wow. It's hard. That's hard. That's hard. It's hard. I remember uh, somebody said somewhere along the line in my journey, I said, well, you know, how do, how do you make a really a good, you know, we are talking about coffee. Yeah. She said, make a thousand. And then make another thousand, and about that time it starts to put together. How was <laughs> I know? I was on the. Uh, Sorry, I thought you were just uh, tied in to get your buddy. Wasn't this past one? Was it? Might have been uh, two years ago, and I've always, like you said, I've always found like very, you know, talkative or you know, very happy to speak to you, whatever. Um, and. Uh, Always ask questions about whatever, and I've always, like you said, I've always bought something. Yeah, it's, you know, and this guy was like, 